ask the public policy group to come up to the stage and get ready for our next uh, conversation. And while they are settling themselves, I'm going to introduce the moderator of this next uh, session, Mike Wilson, and he will introduce the uh, panelists. So uh, there couldn't be a better person to moderate a public policy panel than Mike Wilson, who um, is Executive Director of Sustainable Prosperity, which is a policy think and do tank. And uh, Mike himself has spent many, many years at uh, Environment Canada as a senior policy advisor. Mike was the brains behind uh, the partnership that um, uh, brought together the Globe and Mail into the sustainable, uh, sustainability ranking of some of Canada's largest uh, companies. And he was also the mind behind the development of the sector sustainability uh, tables uh, for the resource sector in Canada, so he knows a lot about these issues. And uh, also a great partner in many different ways uh, on this conference and beyond. So Mike, I'm going to turn the conversation over to you. Or I could kill some. Associated 
Well Prosperity, as well as does work for the OECD on their green growth initiatives. And she spent the better part of her career at the federal government level uh, leading economic group, groups in both the finance and the environmental finance uh, side. Celine Bach is a senior fellow for the Center for International Governance and Innovation, and she's the president of Analytic Advisors. And for everyone who knows Celine, who I suspect most in this room do, she's simply the person in Canada who knows more than anything about the clean tech sector, the state of the clean tech sector in this country. So it's great to have you, Celine. And finally, we have Karen Farbridge. You know, it's said often that cities are both the driver for innovation, for sustainability, and for growth in the economy. Uh, and Karen is the ideal person to speak to that, to that in the role that cities have. She was the mayor of Guelph, and she's now uh, one of the leading experts and leading inspirers, I think, in the city's role in sustainability and, um, and designing healthy, vibrant communities. So um, that is our panel. We're going to start with the presentation, setting the stage by David. It'll we'll take about 10 minutes and run us through to, to introduce us to the, work, the policies that we can unlock in these relationships, and then I'll walk you a series of questions. Both of 
environmental policy and R&D and science policy are even necessary here. The key thing I want to point out is the environmental policy really has to come first. And environmental policy is what's going to drive the demand for clean technologies. And this goes back to the talk David just gave to about what purpose is. I mean, it's a pocketbook in that. Right? If you want to go from getting ideas out of this room to into the broader community, there has to be a reason for people to use them. Right? And so if we can fix the cost savings, if we can be you know, the energy efficiency, if we can say, hey, you're going to be better off when you use it, that's great. Right? There's going to be things where we're probably not going to be able to fix those cost savings. Right? And there, there's going, to have to be a, there's going to have to be policy that's designed to change the incentive structure. Right? To make, to, to have fossil fuels priced properly so that the true cost of price, so the true cost of using electricity is, is incorporated into the price. Right? So creating that demand is really important. Right? R&D plays an important role because it can lower the cost of these policies. Right? One of the challenges we've talk, talked about is just getting the pocketbook. Right? And so to, to the extent that we can come up with ways to make things cheaper, to make it easier to use these technologies, that's going to play an important role as well. So this, you see this bit of a chicken egg thing here. Uh, you, can get, you, you want the cost to go down, but you also need to have the policies in place to incentivize people who want to use them in the first place. Right? But doing things that will promote that R&D is going to be important. Particularly, the R&D is going to help, the R&D policy, the sub is going to help in the creation of technology and helping getting those costs down. But it's not a substitute for environmental policy. Right? We can't think of this as a, as a, as a low-cost, no-cost option. Because without the environmental policy, you're really having to send people to use the technology. So we need to get that out there as well. Okay. So I'm going to talk about some work that, that myself and others have done just to show how different policies shape innovation. So the first thing we know is that innovation responds really quickly to incentives. So a couple of papers that people did look at is what happened after the energy crisis in the 70s. And it just took two or three years for new innovations to come along. Okay. Here's some examples of this. So this, this, this one actually is for innovations to control pollution technology and power plants. So notice there's, there's three different countries here, the US, Japan, and Germany. There's three different spikes in those patent counts. Those three spikes in the years that the countries put the regulation in place. You put a regulation in place, firms are going to do things to come up with better ways to try to comply with what they currently have. This was one of my favorites was a paper that came about, about 10 years ago. So this is about five years ago. This is innovation. Innovations related to climate change. And this could be renewable energy, it could be energy efficiency technologies for industries. It's patents in roughly the NS1 countries, so the countries that were involved in Kyoto. But you'll notice we've set that separate out. The solid line are the countries that actually ratified the follow through to Kyoto. The dashed line is the USA and Australia, which is ratified. You'll see that there's a big difference. Right? That you know, after the post Kyoto, the 98 Kyoto, the post Kyoto, Lots of innovation in countries that actually ratify and follow through pretty much stays flat in the US and Australia. Okay, so again, those policy incentives really make a difference. And just if you want to see it here, here's the more recent data looking at innovation in renewable energy across the world, and see particularly for wind, for wind, which is a green line there, but also for solar. Right, in the last 10 years, as renewable, as renewable portfolio standards, CO2 tariffs have become big, we're getting a lot of innovation in this field. We also want to think about what types of policy to use, because the type of policy that's put in place has a big difference. Now, the broadest way that economists think about this is to separate things what we call command and control, right, which is where we set a limit, but you have to comply with this limit. You can't lose more than X. Right? Versus what we call market-based options, so to try to create a market for cleaner technology. Right? In general, economists tend to prefer the more flexible market-based options, and one reason for that is with a market-based with a market-based incentive, there's always incentive, there's always an incentive to do better. Right? If you're if there's a price on carbon, there's always a reward for reducing your, your carbon use, and you're always going to save money. Whereas if you have a hard target, you have no incentive to do anything other than meet that target. So this is data um, on, on the on the quality of the scrubbers that are used in power plants in the U.S. to remove sulfur dioxide. There's three different policy regimes here. So the first one goes back to the era of 1970. Starting in 1979, so politicians from the coal states were concerned that this was harming this, this was harming their industry. So they put in a requirement that the plants that they to comply with the regulation, they had to install a scrubber. And with some exceptions, this scrubber had to remove 90% of the sulfur dioxide coming out of the power plant. So guess what? The plant did that. You'll notice that the quality of the removal of the scrubber. 
discovers between 1979 and 1990, which is when the next Clean Air Act was passed, pretty much a flat line. 1990 brings in the market-based policy. So that, so that, that was the year that Congress passed, uh, Congress passed the policy that allowed the trade trade for sulfur dioxide. The market doesn't actually start in 1995. Um, the 1990 the law is passed. And you'll see that in the preparation of that, moving up to 1995, now there were some plants that were choosing to, to, to install scrubbers that are really much 95% of pollution because there was a reward for that. So per training, you install a really good scrubber, you reduce your pollution, you have a you have a permit, you have an asset now that you can sell to somebody else. So creating a market gives consensus for continual improvement, where it's just saying the red regulation, people leave that regulation, but there's no reason to do that. We can think of things even a little more, more general, more broadly than that. Because within this group of more flexible policies, right, there's a lot of different instruments that are being used. Right? So it's not just putting a price on carbon. It's not just using permit trading. Right? So we talk a lot about a lot of these during, during day to day. And we can roughly think of these being broken in two groups. So we have things that I'll call technology neutral. So carbon standards is technology neutral. It puts a price on the carbon and the fuel. But you can decide how much, you know, how much carbon you want to use, you know, whether you want to use solar or wind or an alternative to coal if you want a power plant. But leave the technology. Cool. Same thing with cap and trade. You know, say, you got, say you have to meet some, some target, but how you get there is up to you. There are renewable energy certificates, so having a real renewable portfolio standard. Right? Country says you got to have X percent renewables. In some cases, like they, ask, they ask the specifics, you know, a certain amount of people, unless the specifics are, are provided, we're going to see different sounds and use certain types. Versus technology specific policy. So, feed and tariffs, you know, they could be general, but they're often technology specific. And so, Germany is known for all the work they've done on solar. The main reason Germany was able to do that was a very high feed and tariff for, so, for, for solar energy. So, they had feed and tariffs for all renewables, but the feed and tariff for solar was about seven times higher than it was for wind. That's what encouraged the investment in solar energy. They had direct investment subsidies, right? So thinking again about direct support um, for these products as well. Oops. Let me put the button here right there. <laughs> there we go. This is the slide here, right? So the point of this, so economists like to talk, I mean, we talk a lot about industrial policy today. And I'm coming from the US, so I've always been surprised to hear people talking about industrial policy because that's really a non-starter in U.S. politics, um, but it's, yeah, it, it's, relative, it's relevant, it's important. Right? Economists often get concerned about this and say, well, we don't want the government getting involved. We don't want the government picking winners. You know, we should put some kind of broad-based general policy in place and let the market decide. The point I want to leave you with is that even a decision to let the market pick the winners is actually picking a winner. Any policy is going to, is going to favor certain technologies. And so an example of this goes back to the renewable energy system. Work I did with some colleagues at the OECD. We looked, we looked at different renewable energy policies that would particularly focus on the renewable portfolio standards and feed and tariffs. And see how they change the incentives for different innovations, so for wind versus solar in particular. And what we see of that is that if you have a renewable energy mandate, almost all the innovation goes to wind. But why is that? If you're told well, you have to use renewable energy technology, you want to do this in a way that is as cost effective as possible. Wind is a technology that's closest to the market. Wind is a technology that's closest to being competitive with fossil fuels. So if you just tell people you've got to use renewables, they're going to use wind. Okay? They're not going to bother with solar. They're not going to bother with things that are more expensive. The countries where we see a lot of investment in solar are the countries like Germany, where they had a very specific targeted policy that was aimed to incentivize investment in solar. So even the decision to just you know, be technology neutral isn't necessarily technology neutral. It's going to lead you to the technology that's, that's closest to the market. What that means is we have to have a policy trade-off, right? Because the, really the, the primary goal of this technology neutral policy is to be cost-effective, is to let people pick what is the currently the most cost-effective option in the market. And that's great for short-run costs, but if we're thinking about a problem that has a 20, 30-year time frame, and we're thinking that you know, wind isn't going to be enough, we're going to need a diverse portfolio of technologies to be able to combat climate change, then we need to think about complementing these policies with other policies that are going to adapt, that are going to develop some of these longer-run technologies. And what those technologies can be, we can 
I think it was worth discussion in the Q and A. You can certainly argue that maybe it didn't make sense for Germany, which is the northern Europe, to be subsidizing solar and having so much resources going there. And so it's, you know, one of the impacts of Germany investing in solar is it drove the price of panels up. Spain also had a feeding tariff that became so expensive that Spain had to pull out. It would have been better, better to have more of the resources going to Spain, or it actually might have been more productive. But something, you know, whether, whether it's a targeted policy, whether it's the government investing directly in R&D and investing directly or creating the market for these wander-run technologies, you know, but if you want to encourage some of those wander-run technologies, you know, simply putting a price on it, just simply putting a price on it, simply having a renewable, a renewable target, isn't going to be sufficient. There's going to be something to do with kind of incentivizing the wander-run technologies. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I think would be very important. Um, the other thing that uh, is, is uh, I think, important for us to think about is the fact that you know, we have done innovation on financial policies in the past uh, at times where we had critical transitions in the economy. Um, and uh, financial innovation can be as simple as the creation of the mortgage. If we think about it, when we decided that people should own property, they couldn't buy their house. They couldn't afford that. They needed a means to do that. And so we invented the mortgage. Um, and bankers probably didn't really know how to lend to people. And so we thought, okay, well, that's hard for banks. So we're going to backstop that. We're going to create a way of uh, making it possible for the private sector to provide that liquidity, but we're going to provide a credit guarantee. And that guarantee took different forms in different places, but in Canada, that's called the CMHC. And so I think we're at a time in our economy with, the, with climate solutions that are going to be part, a greater part of, of you know, both what we do in Canada and around the world for us to consider those types of um, policy instruments. And then the last thing I'll say is, is about um, the water in which we swim regarding regarding um, information. And I, I, you know, the other day, I don't know if you noticed, but in Bloomberg, um, a, a Bloomberg report uh, was made, I think it was for the month of July, reported in September, that uh, in July, automotive exports exceeded oil and gas exports. I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? We count those things. We actually know how many barrels of oil we export and how many cars are the value of the exports in the automotive industry. Um, well, we don't do that for the low carbon future, for the low carbon economy. Um, and so capital markets can't form uh, because we don't have those statistics. Now, you know, we, we make these, and we, we've been making this report now for four years, and there'll be a fifth one this year. But this is basically the Statistics Canada for the next economy. And when economists are asked to run models, they cannot in include in those models information that doesn't come from Statistics Canada, because everything has to be mutually uh, exclusive and collectively exhausted. So by, by four, so, and the other thing is, it takes about 10 years for Statistics Canada to be able to produce a data set, or we could actually stay closer to 15. Um, so we're at a point in time where the economy is changing, and we can't actually produce a data set quickly enough to be able to understand the transition that the economy is making. So we're going to have to think about other ways of getting that information, which isn't going to take 15 years. And I would suggest that one way of doing that is with trade information that is easy to produce and, and is comparable to the oil and gas industry, the aerospace industry, et cetera, et cetera. And that would enable capital markets to fall around. So those are three ideas. Um, I'm going to move on to Rachel now. And Rachel, can you tell us a little bit about what some of the policy institutions are that uh, governments around the world or Canada are using to drive both environmental and policy and growth? Well, most governments will be looking for ways to improve environmental performance at the same time as supporting economic growth. Most of the focus in the past and to date has been on environmental policy tools, um, their choice and design, and how to limit costs. What's becoming increasingly evident, however, is that um, approaches that go beyond just environmental policies and environmental ministries are most successful in terms of both environmental success and economic success. So the Organization for Economic Cooperation Development, for example, uses terms like policy coherence or policy alignment. And essentially what that means is that um, environment ministries, economic ministries, social ministries are all working together to collaboratively grow in the same direction towards the same goal, both economic goal and environmental goal. Um, one of the examples that OECD uses of policy in recent moment is the taxation of diesel fuel versus gasoline. So um, most 33 of 34 OECD countries that tax gasoline at a higher rate than diesel, despite the fact that diesel and mental work and has gas emissions and air Surprisingly, the, the one country that doesn't do that is the United States. So in terms of uh, an approach of policy compared to policy environment, what does that mean practically? Environmental policies, as has been noted, are still the foundation of uh, sending the market signals out into the economy that drives investment towards the cleaner technologies, products, and services that we need for the transition. But there are sort of three core other policy areas that really need focus in order to have a successful transition. Uh, one is innovation. Uh, 
second is resource and energy efficiency, and the third is infrastructure. So innovation, I mean, Professor Paul talked uh, extensively about innovation, um, and you know, it's, it's the key way to decouple environmental damage and economic growth. It's a way to reduce the cost of environmental policies. Um, it's also the key source of potential new growth opportunities. So having an innovation policy, an innovation system from all the way from skills and education, research and development, um, through to demonstration and financing for commercialization is really essential to ensuring that you maximizing the economic growth opportunities arising from the transition. Um, the, the market, the trade in uh, low carbon and energy efficient Technologies alone is expected to reach two trillion dollars by 2020. So we know that the opportunities are out there and growing. The second area that's important is resource and environmental efficiency. This is another key way: low-cost uh, opportunities to um, start to bend the environmental damage curve away from the environmental growth curve. McKinsey and Company has identified 2.9 trillion dollars of global opportunities from an investor perspective in resource and Efficiency. The International Energy Association did an analysis showing if you cut global energy demand in half, you could actually boost global GDP by 1% at the same time you reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 18%. Here in Ontario, um, the Ontario government says that for every $1 you invest in electricity conservation, you get $2 in cost savings to that electricity system. So clearly there are opportunities we have in this area. The third um, important area for policy alignment is infrastructure. Infrastructure is important because it's long lived and so it's a deter determinant of environmental and economic outcomes for decades to come. It's also an enabler of other technologies. So we've heard this morning of the importance of electric vehicle infrastructure, um, public transit, um, Electricity transmission, for example, and PC storage can enable further development of renewable electricity. So, in ensuring that in infrastructure investments made today are sort of aligned with the future we want um, decades to come is going to be uh, an important area of uh, policy alignment. So, I think overall, the, the conclusion of, of analysis today on green growth policies is that there, there is no one silver bullet policy that will ensure a successful green growth transition. It really is an approach that's government-wide that, that will help maximize um, economic opportunities from the transition and minimize costs. Great, thanks, Rachel. Uh, I'm going to go on to Karen now. Karen, I'd like you to bring this down to the municipal level. As we know, municipalities are of uh, innovation. They're also where a lot of the climate change impacts and environmental impacts and all stuff. So can you tell us what you've done in wealth and what other municipalities can do to both incent private sector green growth and to create a bridge between municipalities and the private sector and moving municipalities in the green growth direction? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, municipalities certainly on the front line of responding to some of the impacts of climate change and dealing with flooding and delays in transit and uh, power outages. Also on the front line, front line of adaptation, um, with 60% of, of infrastructure falling under the municip uh, municipal responsibility in the country, stormwater management being a, a big one of that, um, obviously from the point of view of adaptation as well. But also, um, I think from a from the point of view of mitig mitigation as well on the front line. And certainly, I think over the last decade or more, you've really seen a lot of the action globally uh, by cities and cities working together and, and collaborating around how to address climate change um, at the local level through local action. And as I was sitting and listening to the conversation this morning, um, so many of the, the, the thoughts about where the green economy is going um, have a really strong municipal interface, um, either very directly in the areas like water um, or indirectly you know, in terms of influence or being able to help to enable, certainly around energy has, has been a big one, even open data um, is, and big data is another one. So I think sometimes 
sometimes um, when we don't spend enough time thinking about how municipal, municipal government and communities can be a platform for innovation. Um, and to uh, follow using your language of diffusion and deployment of innovation at, at the local level. Um, from a municipality's perspective, um, the advantages of, of looking at that, um, not just that we have a direct interest in, in the green economy because we have to deploy ourselves a lot of these um, new approaches and technology just to do our job better, to provide a more sustainable and vibrant and healthy community. But from a, an economic development perspective, um, by looking at this as from a point of view of how do we attract investment and jobs into our communities, um, and how we can differentiate ourselves. So differentiate ourselves from other cities and urban areas or the province by uh, differentiating ourselves from the US. Um, we often can lose um, when a, a business is looking where to settle, we can lose to the US because they can bonus. They can give an incentive, a financial incentive we can in Ontario. But there's other ways that we can provide incentives um, if we start looking at how we can be platforms for innovation. And I, the, the area that I would, the two areas, one area that I would talk about from a, a, as an example of a success story, I think, um, and maybe has some lessons to learn from that, would be in the area of water. Um, and I'll use a Guelph story, but this story would be replicated in other communities. Um, and so there's two conditions that sort of, and there's always conditions that set this up, but the two conditions in Guelph are, is we're one of the few municipalities that rely solely on groundwater for our drinking water. Um, and secondly, our wastewater goes into a very tiny river that's uh, a tributary to the Grand River. So two um, big constraints on us. But it really the policy decision, so that leads to innovation and has over the years, but the, the policy decision that really pushed the innovation agenda in water um, was uh, very much community driven and the decision not to build a pipeline and so that we would live sustainability, sustainably within our watershed and not bring water from outside. Um, and fortuitously, just after we made that decision, um, the Ontario Water Opportunities Act came out. And what that ended up doing was creating a whole ecosystem around water technology. Um, it was mentioned earlier this morning that it's a little quiet secret that, that this Ontario, and particularly this region um, in, in southern Ontario, is really a, is a global water technology hub. Um, and so we've been very much part of that and being able to um, use our systems as a platform for piloting or demonstrating technologies which then open up markets elsewhere. And uh, Guelph has been, had delegations from Israel, had delegations from Brazil wanting to see what we're doing. Um, so I think that's a really uh, a great story of how, uh, how it's worked, the provincial policy framework, the municipal policy framework, creating an ecosystem of support to, um, to both for the research and development and then the deployment of, of the technologies. Um, the other area which I think is just enormous in terms of opportunity is energy. And again, there's, there are um, uh, some conditions that are setting that, that up. Obviously, climate change is one of those conditions that people are, uh, are taking that seriously and we're seeing policy development. But also, there's a huge transformation happening of our energy system. It is all going local. And so distributed generation is bringing it down to the local level. It is um, basically it's exposing the systemic inefficiencies in the system that we built over the last century. Um, and so the focus is how it's getting deployed at the local level. And so you're, what you're seeing is um, initially started by the municipal sector, more and more municipalities doing community energy plans, which is really a, a planning tool to set you on a path to a smart energy community. Um, and that, is, uh, the community energy planning process in itself is an incredible platform for engagement um, and then the innovation that comes out of that. Um, and once these plans are in place with the integrated approach that they take, um, there's all kinds of opportunities for the municipality to um, enable the private sectors to come in with, um, with solutions, to provide solutions. 
And I will leave with just one example, and that's local improvement charges. Uh, but I think some, you know, I was in a conversation that someone mentioned it up on stage. Um, Halifax is used in, in the U.S. It's called a PACE grant or a PACE funding. Um, it basically puts the, the it's a financing tool, and it puts it on the property tax bill. Um, and Halifax has used it to promote the uptake of solar. Um, and increasingly in Ontario, Toronto has been piloting, working with it in a pilot way, and more and more municipalities are seeing this as a really big opportunity um, to drive very deep energy retrofits into the existing building stock. Um, so think about the opportunity to be able to use that as a platform for new technologies um, to uh, promote uh, energy efficiency in homes and buildings in our community. That was great. It, it, it almost boggles the mind the range of environmental policy interventions, other policy interventions, the type of outcomes that you can stimulate from those. It's, 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 it's why. So there's, a, there's a lot to think about in this, and there's a lot of element. I want to open it up to the floor now before we go into any other group questions. Can I get some questions from people to individual members of the whole panel? And we should have mics floating around from either side. Um, there obviously is a policy in place with respect to emission standards. 
um, that you want to comment or what are the lessons learned in your opinion? The first lesson learned there is, is, is that enforcement matters. Uh, and so it's actually in the bank. You know, we, we need to think about you know, not just the policy that are in place, but how, how they're going to be administered. Um, and there's a trade off between the complexity of the policy and obviously you know, what can be required to administer it. Um, what are the striking things that I was not really aware of? until this broke in the news is you know, one of the reasons that this was okay in the corporate culture of Volkswagen was that in Europe there's a much more back and forth give and take between the regulatory agencies and the companies. Um, that there's a lot of discussion about what the standards are going to be and how they're going to comply with this. And so Volkswagen saw what they did in the US as kind of an extension of that. You know, we can't we've always done it, we've always kind of done it this way. And, I don't think this is okay to do in Europe, so it's going to be okay to do in the U.S. Obviously, it wasn't okay to do in the U.S. Um, so, it's, you know, so, I think, but I know, so that raises an important point about regulatory capture, right? It's, you know, to what extent the regulators truly are independent of the, of the people that they're regulating. And I think that's probably the most, you know, I think politically, it's probably the most important lesson that could come out of that. Do you think people have views on that? Is actually more of a lesson for business than, than for governments in the sense that it, it shows that even, even if you can pass the, the government test, that um, you know, your consumers are you know, ultimately going to determine uh, the impact on your, on your business. So um, you know, I, th I think that a lot of businesses are probably uh, looking at, at how they're doing things and ensuring that they're, they're, they will hold up to scrutiny, the scrutiny of their customers in the future. Well, it speaks to the disconnect on the slides that were just done before this panel um, between where the C-suite is evaluating some of these issues and where the general public is evaluating some of these issues. Well, let's build off that. David brought up the concept of picking winners or whether government should pick winners or whether they implicitly got to sell in the way that they can be regulated. What is, as government gets beyond strictly regulating and creating incentives, doing industrial policy or whatever you want to call it, what is the what, what is the relationship between government, private sector, both the regulated and the the, the innovators in the economy? <laughs> um, well, I, you know, when there's limited resources, scarce um, resources to spend, and, you know, it's hard to make decisions, but but important to be strategic. And, and I think there's two areas to be strategic. Transition. One is is looking at where you need solutions. So where are the industries that, that face technological challenges, cost challenges in terms of, of the transition, and focusing on developing innovations you need. And the other is where where your strengths are in comparison to the opportunities that are occurring globally, and, and that that can be uh, important areas of strategic focus. And we've seen success in the Ontario water technology story. I think is an example of that where a constraint is imposed. And at the same time, there was significant investment in uh, research and development and training. And the combination of those things led to um, s several successful entrepreneurs. And I think the number of companies is around 900 um, in, in Ontario now. And we've seen um, stories like that around the world. In Australia, um, a number of companies, in response to the, the drought that they were facing, a number of companies developed that are extremely successful in irrigation technology and software that are exporting uh, globally around the world. And when you look at predictions of 40% uh, of the world living in river basins under severe water stress by 2050, you know the market is, is only going to uh, grow exponentially. So um, thinking strategically in terms of our new policy would be good. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. I think the, um, the ecosystem that I described that, that developed through after the Ontario Water Opportunity Act it's the show, showcasing water innovation program, um, water tax, the Southern Ontario Water Consortium, a whole bunch of groups. What it provided for um, certainly uh, Guelph and other municipalities was a bridge between the private sector and, and the municipal uh, government. Um, our, 
municipal government is not well structured to um, engage directly with the private sector beyond you know, very traditional tendering processes and request for proposals. It's hard for us to partner because of the legislative framework that we operate under. The rules are so strict. Um, we're also not, it's not our strength in terms of research and development. We don't have the money for that either. So, yeah, we get lots of um, technology companies coming to try to sell their wares. And so how do you evaluate between that? We can't. And so I think what the ecosystem has done is this, you know, there's a whole process of vetting, and um, when something goes through one of the um, you know, showcasing water innovation programs, um, it, it gets extremely well vetted, so that helps with the municipality. Reduces our risk because there's a partnership there between the province and municipality and the private sector. Um, so it's helped to facilitate the risk. Um, with uh, making a decision to demonstrate or bring in that new technology and geosystem. Um, but the outcomes are huge. I, what I didn't mention was that you know, through um, the various uh, technologies that we have brought in over the years, through this sort of bridging that has happened, uh, we have decoupled water consumption from population growth and continue as our population grows, our water consumption continues to drop. Um, and then on the wastewater side, um, we're operating our um, current facility and our current and managing wastewater on half of the built infrastructure um, and through optimization. And so the cost savings for the municipality not to have to build an expensive expansion, uh, but we've got 50% extra capacity in our existing system that we built over the years. Um, so those are the outcomes, um, real outcomes for the municipality. Um, I guess I have a question from our water company who proposed to a city a distributed small footprint solution for some development that's occurring right now. And because they were an SME, who by the way is implemented all around the world, they weren't given the opportunity. So small small business procurement or the procurement from smaller firms is still not easy. And, and you've just given I mean, you've given us a success story, but it's still not it's not uh, not solved. Um, I guess the other perhaps the other dimension I could add is is just the the fact that we now have within the to the UN, the, the COP sort of structure, the solution agenda, right? So, so at COP in Paris, there is going to be a great deal more attention uh, uh, paid about solutions. So whereas you know, in the past, there were, there were three legs to the stool. There was the actual agreement, there were the national commitments, there was climate finance, but then there was there was nothing to actually translate that. There was no place that, that the, country, the countries and subnationals and, and municipalities and industrial associations, you name it, there was nowhere they could go and say, well, here are our pro projects and here are our commitments to that national goal. So if you think about it as a corporate restructuring, you know, the first part is the, the agreement is perhaps not relevant, but the, the country commitments are like our corporate restructuring goal. We need to reduce costs by this much, in this case it's carbon, we need to increase revenues by such an amount. So that's our goal. And then we're gonna pay for it with finance, okay? But then we have no project office that's keeping track of how we're gonna to get to our goal to do our corporate restructuring. So that's what the solutions agenda is. And I mean, I'm not an expert on costs, but I will go to this one. And what I'm hearing from people who've been to many is that there's a different discussion that's occurring because of the solutions agenda, which is going to be built out over the next six to eight years. And so we'll be all working on these problems together. Yeah, I, I think one, one thing, and I think about the role of the regulators, I think you, know, you want to separate out what's important for the green economy and just what's important for the economy and business in general. Right? So Volkswagen's relationship with the regulators in Europe isn't about wasn't about producing producing emissions. It's about promoting the global auto industry. Right? And I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is that you know, the policy, the environmental policy we're talking about, can kind of shape the direction the company goes in. But that, for most companies, that's going to be second to just the policies that are in place that promote or hinder hinder business development in general. 
Um, so again, I'm, I'm going to use, I'm going to use um, Germany and solar again as an example. This is an example of they can they can be used for any time. So, you know, um, so you know, one result of the German theater tariffs was that Germany was very successful in getting the cost of solar energy down. But that innovation didn't really, that didn't take place in Germany. Most of those solar panels are being produced in China and then exported into Germany. Right? It didn't create jobs for German companies. It created jobs for Chinese companies. So there's, there's local jobs that matter in the community economy. Somebody, somebody in Germany has to install those panels. But the panels can be produced where the cost is lowest. Right? And so you know, thinking about kind of a broader economic framework still has to be, still has to be the, number, the number one priority. Right? The environmental policy can shape the direction that's going to go in. But these things can be created anywhere. I mean, we create the demand, but you know, the, the production of turbine and the production of everything they use is going to go where the business plan is most favorable. Um, a question over here. I have a quick question for Karen, actually, uh, to municipal risk specifically. And I was thinking about what David had said earlier about the world CEO motivation for change. And I'm wondering at a municipal level if some of the more recent legal risks that have come up for inaction around updating infrastructure and being more resilient to climate actions. Uh, what's your position on that, or, or what have you seen from your peers and your colleagues and municipalities around uh, Ontario and Canada? Is that is that a driver? Is it a motivator? Or it take those legal risks from a risk perspective? Yes. Yeah, from no, absolutely. Risk. I think actually um, uh, two areas of risk for a municipality which are helping to uh, promote some act, promote action. One is um, the risk of service sustainability with escalating energy costs. So if we look at uh, energy is the, is the next line item down from compensation. So it's a, a big cost at the municipal level. Um, and so if you project out over the, over the long term, generally rising infrastructure costs, that's a business risk to our ability to continue to provide services. Because I think you know, generally everyone feels that the property tax system is pretty maxed out. We've got some, a lot of additional costs in Ontario property tax system that aren't in other provinces. So that's one area of risk. And then the other area of risk is absolutely around resilience and, and um, starting, you know, beginning to connect the dots from that public and, uh, works employee who's dealing with the flooding and the, the, the corporate energy manager who's working to make efficiency happen in our facilities. So those dots are getting connected and understanding that risk as well. Great, thank you. Um, we're going to do a slight tweak in the agenda, so I'm going to ask Steve to come up now and introduce the team. But we'll leave that up to you. This was a great discussion, so thank you to everyone. That was a really good